So what we're going to do today is, is talk a little bit about climate change policy in the UK context. Um, the climate emergency is something that is getting a lot of attention right now. Um, it's a big thing in the news for the last several months, a year. Um, and we wanted to try to unpack that with you and also do that through the guise of co-production. Um, to think about could co-production be a culture of trying to, to sort through this big sticky issue of climate emergency. To think about how we um, solve climate change or think about climate change in an inclusive way differently than, than what cities uh, have traditionally done. Could, could I just ask people to come into the circle? As you, much as possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, so, so to begin to begin the discussion, we're 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 really thankful that we have two people to help us talk about the climate emergency and co-production and, and local policy development. Um, we have one climate activist, Heather, um, who's here with us today, and, and we also have Mark, who's here from Sheffield City Council. So they're going to help us try to frame this issue um, here at, in Sheffield in the UK. Um, and, and this discourse is much broader than the UK, but thinking about it uh, where we are here. So, um, Heather, could I, could I start by just asking you a little bit about what the climate emergency is from the, the activist perspective? What, what is this whole climate emergency that's been in the news for, for a long time now that, that different groups have thought about very differently? How, how do you think about climate emergency? What does it mean to you? Well, it's not new to me. <laughs> I was aware of limits to growth, the, the document in the 80s. We were living beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. And um, over the years, been active in different groups and helped set up Sheffield Campaign Against Climate Change in the early 2004, I think. <coughs> so it's not new. But I do think that the extinction of Greta Thunberg and the Extinction Rebellion have really brought it to the fore. So I think two things have happened. One, there has been this movement, but also the <coughs> scientists are now saying it's going much, much faster than even they can predict. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people know and they've heard it, you know, the Greenland ice sheet is melting at 5,000 tonnes a second, uh, four times faster than the scientists predicted. And of course that has knock-ons has knock-ons on sea level rise, has knock-ons on the warming of the sea and effect on the oceans. Um, and that, of course, affects the whole energy in the climate system, which, of course, then is also <coughs> saying, that, you know, we have these amazing hurricanes, like Hurricane Dorian, only a couple of months ago, Bermuda, it's now sort of gone off the headlines, but absolute devastation. Um, and the droughts that have been affecting um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and we know that they're going to get a lot worse. So we know that there's an emergency in terms of escalating global warming, but we also know there's an emergency in terms of ecological emergency. And they're, and they're both, I mean, they feed into each other, but there's also human cause in terms of continuing <coughs> deforestation and continuing uh, burning the peat bogs. So there's, the, there's a kind of, for me, I'm a psychologist as well, an emergency of uh, human beings in kind of knowing now that this is happening and carrying on business as usual. I've just been um, a week in London on the Extinction Rebellion. And um, as, as you probably know, it's brought it up in the news. And it's, it's, it's about not being popular. <laughs> At Newsnight was very interesting. I don't know if people saw that. Um, everybody said, "Well, you know, I agree with I, I agree with the aims, but not the methods." Um, but it's those methods that sort of major disruption and thousands of people that does brought, bring it to people's attention. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of trying to deal with this emergency of business as usual, mm -hmm. and people know know what's going on, but. 
And there may be a complacency, I don't know what other people think, because Parliament declared an emergency in April and done nothing. <laughs> um, they, uh, Sheffield declared emergency, as we know, in January. Um, February. <laughs> so people can think, oh, at last, 50% of local authorities in Britain have declared an emergency. But nothing has actually changed. Our public transport system hasn't radically improved. We've not got masses of grants for insulation. So we might feel, oh, good, something's happening. And I think that's an emergency. So you talked about emergency being, climate emergency being something that's not new for some circles, but it's a, a sort of rhetorical tool that, that's been used to, to raise the specter of the challenge for those that are thinking about it as an emergency. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. Can I just say, I think, sure. I think it is an emergency, and what the scientists are now saying is that there is um, temperature rise locked in, that whatever we do now, there's increasing temperature rise that there will continue to be major climatic events. Um, so, it, so, you know, that, that's an emergency to act around. And, and even in adaptation, let alone mitigation. Yeah, but part of, part of Extinction Rebellion is all about getting people to recognize this emergency that's here. Um, and one of the, the goals of Extinction Rebellion is telling the truth, getting organizations to declare an emergency um, so when, when you're able to get a council to declare an emergency, what, what does that mean? Well, we've seen to rebellion have had good meetings, actually, with the council since March. And I've been looking at what other councils are doing. And I'm, I'm very interested in what Oxford's been doing. And they had a commission. They developed a commission across the spectrum with the um, Trades Council, Council, University, Extinction Rebellion, Friends of the Earth, and they then decided a question for the sit a citizens' assembly. And they've also had that televised, it's on the website, all the expert information. So that's sort of what one council is doing, trying to get so that the general public are aware of what those issues are. Uh, and the other one is Leeds, I'm very interested. Currently, they've got a citizens' jury, a smaller project. But again, they've got the, the big, yeah, what's it called, Leeds Big City Climate Conversation. And uh, different ways really, of getting that, telling the truth, getting it out, um, and, and how everybody can think, oh, what could this city be? It could actually be a better place. Yeah, so on, on some of your seats, there's actually information about what a uh, citizen's assembly is. Uh, we're sitting around in this circle, we're gonna think through what a, citizens jury is so, so so these are really important things that are going on right now in response to, to thinking through how we deal with emergency what it looks like in action um, which I guess yeah. brings us to Sheffield so we'll come over to to Mark Whitworth would you like to say what your role is Mark uh, yes yeah, so my role at Sheffield City Council is that I'm the manager for sustainability and climate change so I'm uh, responsible for the work that we're developing around our approaches on wider sustainability, but clearly at the moment the focus is around the climate emergency, around climate change, and very recently I've also uh, started taking on a role around clean air as well because of the, uh, obviously there's a, a quite a significant overlap between the work that the city's doing around developing a clean air zone, proposed clean air zone, uh, but also some of our longer term ambitions around becoming zero carbon uh, and the announcement that, uh, that we made back in February. So what does the climate emergency mean to you in your role at Shepherd City Council and you know, how has it affected your work? So, I mean, I, I would agree with the points that, that Heather made in terms of the science and the, the, the evidence and of course the, the longevity, the fact that that information um, has been around for quite some time now um, and clearly as we, uh, as we start to experience different weather events, it becomes clearer that, that the, the consequences of not taking action uh, are becoming intolerable, and I think we, you know, we need to be looking at actually the sorts of things that we can be that we can be doing. Uh, so, from a from a city council perspective, there's also one of the things that I'm sure Heather would agree with, but didn't know was also some of the local impacts and the fact that we need to be considering uh, what climate change means for Sheffield, uh, both in terms of actually how we can reduce our impact on the climate, but also how we mitigate 
and how we adapt and how we become more resilient. And any of you who were on the, the, the walking tours yesterday will have seen some of the things that we're doing here in Sheffield, whether it's the energy recovery facility or those of you who braved the rain and went down and had a, had a walk around some of the, uh, the riverside will have seen why it's so important that we're building in things like sustainable urban drainage systems into our new developments and recognising the value of, of those. Uh, and I think that declaring a climate emergency is a really strong way of actually showing uh, to, uh, to the internally within the council, but also to with, with our partners across the city, why we need to be investing in those sorts of infrastructure investments, why we need to be making decisions uh, that enable us to, uh, to, to plan and make sure that uh, we're considering the wider implications of, of climate change. Do you want to say more about um, the work you've done with the Tyndall Centre, so like where you've got to so far, but also then what's going to come next? What, what things will you have to address to um, act on the climate emergency? Yeah, because I think Heather made a good point in that things haven't changed you know, in terms of the government declaring an emergency. There hasn't been a rapid ramping up of, of, of uh, legislation. There haven't been the changes um, that people might have expected. And I think it's really important that we don't become complacent. So. I think part of our work in the city is about understanding where we can make the biggest impact. What can we do to try and reduce our impact on the climate? Where can we uh, operate as a council? What's the role with local partners, other stakeholders in the city? And also recognising that we're going to require support from national government. What are the things that we need to be doing in terms of the messages that are going back? And being very clear on understanding what the resource ask is to actually Heather mentioned about insulating homes, for example. What, what does that look like? We've got some idea of that, but of course, if we're framing that within a one and a half degree, not uh, avoiding one and a half degrees, or if we're looking at that as a, a, around achieving that by 2030, what sort of what sort of investment is required to do that? Because we have, in the past, delivered some very big insulation programs, but nothing on the scale that's required here. And that's not just Sheffield. That's the same for Manchester. That's the same for Liverpool, for Leeds. You know, for all for all those other cities. What we have done thus far is, uh, you mentioned the work we did with the Tyndall Centre. We, we work with the Tyndall Centre at the University of Manchester, Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, and they produced a carbon budget for the city. Uh, so it's a science-based approach which looks at the Paris Agreement and in effect just scales that down to the UK level, to a city level, and establishes what your budget is that you need to remain within if you are going to uh, deliver your share of the Paris Agreement. And for Sheffield, that was a budget of 16 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. And <coughs> the staggering figure of that is actually all the, the, the data from that shows that we need to decarbonise at a rate of at least 14% per annum in order to remain within that budget. Uh, and that would mean that if we continue at the 2017 rates, we use that entire budget within six years or six and a half years. And again, that will be the same for every other city, you know, with a similar sort of budget uh, in the UK. So it's, it's that sort of scale of, of, of challenge that we, that we face. But we now know that, and as Heather said, the, the message around tell the truth, as in make that message, put that message out, let people know, uh, is something that we're doing. We're having uh, conversations both internally and externally. I think as a large organisation in the city with lots of different um, diverse services, it's important that our employees understand the scale of the challenge. So we've been having conversations through various tiers of the organisation to, to, to let people know about the scale of the challenge. So if, I think you know, people have clearly seen the news, they understand what's going on. What they don't understand is what can they do or what is, uh, what, what's your employer doing in terms of reacting to it. And so we started to be able to explain about those sorts of things that, uh, that we're looking to, to try and take forward, including the, the Citizens Assembly. Thanks for that. I hope that's set the scene for um, what the climate emergency looks like from a UK perspective, from a Sheffield perspective. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to do a little interview with Ryan. So um, I'll, I'll ask you about it, but because his, his PhD research has actually been around co-production and climate action. So we're going to use that to set the scene of what might happen on a co-production front. So, uh, Ryan, can you describe um, what kind of work you've been doing in Greater Manchester around uh, climate action? Yeah, so I'll, I'll preface it by saying, as Heather pointed out, this climate emergency that, that we're faced with is something that's, that's been around for much longer than the last year, but, but this language of emergency has been only around for a year. So, 
the landscape, what, what I've worked on, um, was very different than the landscape we're in now in some ways. In many ways, it's exactly the same. Um, but things are starting to change slightly. Um, so I'll, I'll preface what I've done um, with that. So um, in 2017, May 2017, Andy Burnham was elected mayor of Greater Manchester as part of Greater Manchester City Deal with national government. Um, they, they had to, to gain a, an elected city mayor, city region mayor. Um, so in the lead up to his election, he held a number of hustings events to figure out exactly what his manifesto would say on environment. And he listened to what groups had to say and there were lots of different inputs he was getting. So it was really hard to figure out what his position would be. Um, so he decided to host a, list, uh, a green summit, um, a citywide summit to think about what Greater Manchester's policy on, on climate change, specifically mitigation, would be. Um, but doing so, like Mark described, looking at carbon budgets for the city region um, matched with um, a toolkit called Scatter um, that looked at different levers that the city region could pull to try to reduce its carbon emissions. So it had this the scientific technical strand that would lead into the Green Summit. Um, but something that, that I was working on was more with citizens, also trying to think about what do citizens want? If these changes we need to make in cities are going to fundamentally change the way we live, work, um, enjoy the city, um, how can we make sure that, that that takes place in a way that facilitates a city that citizens actually want, make sure that their needs are represented in, in those changes? Um, so we embarked on a, an about a nine month process of engagement. Um, where we had these uh, uh, listening events where we engage citizens on a deep level, talking to them about what the science says, what, what the level of change is needed, and asking them about what they think would, would be done if they were the mayor, um, and trying to figure out a way of matching that technical scientific approach with that more bottom-up participative approach. Um, and kind of at a higher level of all of this um, was a steering group that was assembled between local government, city regional government, academia, the private sector, voluntary sector, to try to advise the process, to try to advise how these different views would be taken on board and ultimately put into a policy. Eventually, um, in March of this year, um, there was a five-year environment plan that was put out by the combined authority um, that tried to, to link up that technical and bottom-up approach. Um, there's a lot that's left on the table um, but, but this was something very different than what the combined authority had done in the past. It was something very new for them. Do you want to say any more about the challenges of that or how it was different to what had happened in the past that, that feels useful at the moment? Yeah, um, so there were a number of, of challenges along the way. Um, this from the very beginning, the combined authority talked about in that, that higher level Green Summit steering group it was called. Um, in the room, they would say, this is a co-productive process. We want to co-create this event, this policy together. Um, we're not the ones holding the reins. We all are collectively. Um, so they, they were using language that was reminiscent of co-production, but when hard decisions needed to be made, that, that open process closed down. Um, the, the, the 10 local authorities that, that make up Greater Manchester um, because of austerity, a lot of their funding from national government has gone away. They own a large stake in the Manchester airport. So this was a big issue that, that was discussed in the, in the Green Summit Steering Group, but also by citizens, talking about um, if you flew into Manchester, you'll have seen uh, lots of construction. There's about a, a, a billion pound investment into the airport. Um, so we were talking in the steering group meeting about if we're gonna try to radically reduce our carbon emissions, we need to think about the airport because locally this is a huge, huge emitter um, and we can't be talking about increasing the volume of flights going in and out, but also talking about reducing our emissions. Um, and that was called a sensitive issue. And in those meetings, what was said is, we'll address those sensitive issues later. Let, let's talk about what, what we can all agree upon now. So, in this open co-productive process, there were some things that were on the table that were up for discussion. Um, there were some new ideas put on the place around energy generation, but things around um, the airport, the pension fund, things that are seen as more sensitive, um, the conversation really shut down there. So, so that was something that um, was really interesting. Mm. I think we should. So, we 
hand over to the next stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to sit over there, I think, and get just oh, come over come here. here. So, so that was just a, a really quick highlight of one, one process that, that was supposed to be co-productive. It tried to be co-productive. Um, in interviews with people that, that were um, involved in this process, many of them said, yes, we, we realized that it meant to be co-productive, but it felt like it fell short of that. Um, so I think co-production is, is a word, is a phrase that gets thrown around very broadly, but there's lots of different conceptions about what co-production is. Um, so I'd like to invite Jez, um, who's going to be leading an activity with us. If, if you could talk about what co-production means to you, um, but also in, in the guise of citizens' assembly, citizens' jury, some things you've thought about, um, okay. if you want to weave that in. Yeah, I'll introduce myself a little bit first. So on the chairs, there's something about citizens' assemblies and, and, and climate change, and that was a blog written by a colleague in my organisation. Um, and so we do run citizens' assemblies and citizens' juries, and in fact we're facilitating the Leeds climate inquiry that's going on at this particular moment. And, and, and for me, co-production is really about how you bring together different knowledge bases, how you take lived experience and technical knowledge and all of the different perspectives on what some people would call a wicked problem, a problem to which there is no simple yes, no answer. So how should we respond to the climate emergency is a very wicked problem because there's trade-offs and there's other issues like social equality you know who's going to be the losers from this who's going to you know take the, the primary cost because some people have been living a very successful high carbon lifestyle for a long time and now suddenly people who are just hoping to to kind of have that holiday in Benidorm at last are being told that they're being bad so what is the trade-off between the interests of human beings and the interests of the planet? And these are very wicked problems. So for me, a climate, uh, sorry, a citizen's jury or a citizen's assembly really is co-production at pace. Because co-production can be a long-term process. It can take a long time to build relationships, to reach people, to have conversations, to research the issue. And in a sense, a citizen's jury is a very structured co-production at, at pace with a very specific underlying principle. And that principle is that you recruit a microcosm of the general public. It's called a mini-public. So rather than try and involve everybody, you try and find a group of people who reflect the diversity of the city or the town, come from non-aligned positions, so they're not climate activists or technical officers or anybody, they're just the general public, and you bring them together to have a conversation, to get to understand the issue between themselves, and then to be able to interrogate expert testimony, to get a set of inputs from te technical expertise, different perspectives on both sides of the argument, to be able to interrogate that, that's why the word jury exists in that to some degree, and then to come up with a set of recommendations. And I'm just going to finish off that little bit, that one of the biggest sort of um, cause celebrators or, or celebrated uh, citizens' assemblies was the Irish Constitutional Convention that happened a few years ago, where they brought 100 citizens together, selected at random, to represent the diversity of the Irish population, and they made a number of policy recommendations. And two things that emerged from that process was the vote on abortion, legalising abortion in Ireland, and also the vote on same-sex marriages, both which were issues that politicians have been unable to grapple with for very many years. But through the process and the idea that this was representing the authentic voice of ordinary people rather than activists or campaigners, it sort of gave the politicians confidence to, to be a bit braver than they would otherwise be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think those Is are that a good explanation of the yeah. kind of co-production at pace? <laughs> yeah, and, and when we're thinking about big changes in the city to mitigate climate change, to mitigate emissions, a lot of this is about bringing together different groups of stakeholders and communities throughout the city making sure that those different knowledge bases can be utilized to create 
the future we all want. So, so I think that's something really useful to think about. I mean, one of the great dilemmas for activists is what if the citizens' assembly or citizens' jury say, actually, no, we don't want to uh, do anything, you know, because people have a vested stake in this issue. We hope they will actually make some useful recommendations. Yes, by getting to hear from the experts and, and interrogate them, make the decisions that, that you would hope they would. Yeah, so but th then it has to be handed on, so at the end of the process there's generally some form of public event or stakeholder conference where the recommendations are then handed back to politicians, to officers, people like yourself, mm -hmm. who then work out how to actually implement those recommendations. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move this along now. Yeah. So you're, you probably, when you walked in, thought, why is the room organized in this really silly way that's different than all the other workshops? Um, and there's a reason for it. And what we're going to do is, is think about one of these processes all together. Um, mm. So Jez, who, who has run many, many, many of these sorts of activities, <laughs> um, is going to help us try to visualize it as participants. Yeah. Many, many, oh, could, it could go horribly wrong at this particular <laughs> point. That's the That's so the what we're going to do is do a little scenario. Do you want to take it forward to the scenario page? So I've created this, this model place. I don't know if you can read it. I'll read it out. There's a few sheets here. So this is the Bradfield Climate Change Citizens' Assembly. It's not quite Bradford. It's not quite Sheffield. Who comes to Bradfield in Sheffield? I didn't know that. I, well, I am not told that, but there, there's no, there's no person. So this is Bradfield. Bradfield is a Pennine town with a population of about 700,000 people. So it's this sort of scale of city um, with a strong university and a very mixed demographic. So it's quite like Sheffield. Um, it includes an urban centre, suburbs, and also some very isolated rural communities. And more, or lo more low income spread across the rural and city centre population. And the more affluent people live in the sort of suburbs around it. Um, uh, it's also close to a motorway network and it's served by, um, but it's poorly served by rail or bus transport. So that's kind of a bit like this urban centre with the standard characteristics of many urban centres. Um, do you want to go on one page? Uh, and, and some local residents in Bradfield, I'm going to read this out, who take part in Extinction Rebellion have demanded that local taxes and some charges should be raised to enable the city to tackle the climate emergency. So there's a call to raise local taxation so you can invest in change and perhaps penalise carbon emitting activities as such. Um, or maybe restrict car use inside the city and invest in public transport or for the council to disinvest from fossil fuels. So there's a whole range of demands that are emerging from activists about what the council has to do. But other residents worry about costs, incomes, and the implications for their daily lives. There is no common political vision of how to respond to the climate emergency in the city council. So as part of the declaration of the climate emergency, the council is committed to holding a citizens' assembly in Bradfield. Um, but it is also aware of a citizens' assembly is expensive and so needs to decide how many people chosen at random would sit on the climate inquiry, as well as many other design questions. So what we're going to do is a little scenario where we're going to ask for some volunteers. <laughs> we need five to seven volunteers. One. Any more? Two. Three. Four. Five. One there. Can I ask you to come and sit round the table in the middle, please? Has anybody heard of Occupy? No. Yeah. Occupy was a sort of street protest movement a few years ago. You might not be able to see it, but there were some hand signals for working in citizens' assemblies or public assemblies where large groups of people could take part without actually speaking. So I invite anybody to use the hand signals as that conversation goes on and, and, and just affirm or otherwise. And the first one is, I agree with the conversation. Mm -hmm. So if you agree with the point you hear, either at the table or in the table, then you can do that. If you disagree, think it's like that. <laughs> if you really strongly oppose it, you think that's a really bad idea, you can do this. <laughs> and if it's so bad that you just can't allow it to happen, you can block it like this. 
So these are some of the many hand signals that are used in these sorts of assemblies. So, please feel free to use those if you like. And let's get on with the first round of conversation. So what I would like you to do as a small group, and please talk loudly, but to yourselves, who else needs to join your design group and why? Who else should be part of the group designing the citizens' jury? Not the members of the jury, but the people designing it. Any, I invite you to get going. And you have five minutes for this first question. Okay. I think we need to have uh, representatives from the residents because we don't seem to have any residents. Mm. Mm, but I think they will be invited to join the, um, the inquiry. They maybe don't need to join us for the design. Well, I don't know what you think, but whatever we are designing affects them directly, mm. so I think it is important that they're represented. Mm. Aren't you representing them, though? I am, but also it's good that they are here to support or even disagree with what I'm saying. As you know, sometimes not everyone comes to the you know, meetings or to the surgery, so it will be good to have, and some conversations take place within communities, and I think it's important that they bring them in directly. Any other perspectives? Do we have anybody from the trade unions at all? No. Um, would that be helpful? They didn't turn up. There's somebody here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they were obviously too busy. This person was from the trade union. Um, so the voice of unionised labour, labour within Bradfield City Council okay. didn't turn up. Oh. So ca can we presume that they are... Yeah. So they might be re-invited. Okay. Maybe we need some more specialists from the city and maybe from the universities mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. take a part in this as well. No one from... No, well, no. I'm an academic, but That's uh, right. okay. uh, I'm not a specialist. <laughs> Perhaps we need somebody more from the organisational thing, representing the, 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 the institutions of the city. Mm -hmm. Any other views on who should be part of this group that isn't the design group? And probably if I can go back to my initial mm -hmm. suggestion, because I think I've just been thinking, I've just been saying representatives uh, from residents, you know, People come from different backgrounds, so mm. we may need young people, some people mm. representing the different equality strands, mm. because you know different people are affected by these issues differently. Yeah. So mm. we may need just more than one person representing the residents. Mm. Who would add value to your conversation and, and perhaps trust to the quality of your group? Mm. Somebody medical, possibly. Somebody understanding the, uh, the medical implications of climate well, change? Well, there's so much health issues uh, related to climate change. Do we have anyone uh, knowledgeable in, in behaviour change mm. um, in the towns? So someone who knows how to run a campaign or what makes people change their behaviour yes. or something like that? Mm. I'd like to follow up on, on your point from your estate and whether there are a, a particular campaigns, there might, there might be an anti-racist campaign or uh, somebody who can, is involved with youth justice. So pe somebody who can speak for those, those groups, those be it the black and minority ethnic community or young people. As I don't know, Bradfield. Perspectives to Pardon? Issue? Feminist perspectives to this? As a feminist so perspective to too. Mm -hmm. So somebody from the industry here, who do you, how do you, do you feel a bit isolated here? As somebody who's a rail franchise user? Yeah. Still, I, I miss some representative that knows about the figures and facts in the city, a planner or, or a yeah. specialist on, on the climate work that they do in the city. Not just, it's good with councillors, but they are politicians and, and we need somebody that know the uh, background and reality, maybe. I wonder, from a business is crucial, isn't it? From the whole industry yes. and business and finance sector. Because if we're going to have change at the level that's needed, those people are going to 
need to embrace change mm -hmm. and whether we needed somebody else from the maybe the finance sector on, on our panel. There's one more point there and then I'm going to close up for a second. Okay. Yeah, may, maybe we should need the mayor to take part in this as well, not just okay. councillors, okay. but also the mayor. Is it important to have um, somebody representing um, faith communities, but mm -hmm. actually particularly mm -hmm. Muslim mm -hmm. community, which is substantial in this, in this area, I imagine? The other person who was invited couldn't turn up was a church leader who went to the local <laughs> food bank. Um, yeah. and, and also, uh, okay. we're developing a memorandum of understanding between the voluntary community and social enterprise sector, so perhaps somebody from that sector. What about other businesses besides mm. just the transport? Because you know, like uh, you know, the supermarkets and other mm. other businesses. Mm. I'm going to stop you there, but I think that was really helpful in terms of trying to understand who are the stakeholders. Mm. But I think it's really important to understand that the oversight group—that's who you are, <laughs> the design group—is there to make sure that this process is trusted. So your role, in a sense, is to make sure that anybody observing the later inquiry will think, OK, this was yes. well thought out. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, it has to have a range of perspectives, including the emitters or the people who are producing carbon, people who have got a role in the voluntary sector. So there has to be a diversity of people in that oversight group. But it doesn't need to be so big that it is mm -hmm. the inquiry itself. We're going to move on to the second question now, because I know time is always pressing. And so the second question for your little mini deliberation is, what role should elected officials play within a citizen's inquiry or a citizen's participatory process, and how is it different from their usual role? They should be listeners, mm -hmm. I think, for the most. Any other perspectives? You're a councillor. I think as a councillor, I don't know if my role should specifically be that different because I think in addition to listening, it's also about bringing the views, the points from my local constituency and uh, other things that I probably think as an individual as well in my specific role. So we've, we've been doing some interesting work around what does a future councillor look like? What's a 21st century councillor? And I think this could be a very uh, relevant space for, for some of the uh, of people interested in, in what that new role might be into the future. So it's an innovative kind of space to explore that. So, um, yeah, I, I propose that, that we kind of look for councillors like yourself or, and also perhaps some, some newly elected councillors. Probably. One other thing, maybe the role may, be, may slide differently, especially that we are looking at climate change, is thinking beyond just my uh, constituency because climate change affects everybody. And there are certain things that may be happening or not even happening in my constituency, but it affects others. So it's sort of stepping, crossing those boundaries, mm -hmm. those physical boundaries <coughs> as a councillor. So I think that's one key that may be slightly different from my day-to-day -day role. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to that like officials also come with with an open mind of actually showing that they want to listen and not defending we have already done that or we have these plans in place but actually wanting to wanting to to do what we will discuss is, is there a debate that's needed about <coughs> if we're the elected council if um, that when the citizens' jury or the assembly comes up with recommendations, what's our responsibility to it? We can listen, but are we going to, to what extent are how, we going? How binding is it? How binding? So we, I think we need that discussion before we even start, really. Well, it's part um, of the transparency, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, what the remit? To, for the whole thing to be credible. Credible. Because otherwise, some of the people in the population will just say, oh, well, they, they're doing this it's to make it look good, but they're not actually going to take any notice. Right. And we all know how many government commissions there's been, exactly. you know, which never get anywhere. Come up with marvellous recommendations, mm. but they're not implemented. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps if, if this is going to be a greenwashing initiative, then we, we don't want to be part of it. No. But the same might agree with business and trade unions as well. 
how much are we committed to the Citizens' Assembly and their recommendations? Or how much are we still looking at the shareholders? Any other reflections on the role of elected representatives in the face of a mini public of randomly selected citizens who, in a sense, represent people? Is that a challenge or yes. not welcome? Oh, yes. It's a challenge, yeah. And it also, if we're talking about like, um, if if we are to, re this is to reflect the views of the public, I guess it's quite important who is invited or who is part of it um, in terms of how, how will this look from the outside later on. So that's another potential mm. role of this body is to make sure that the process for recruiting people to the inquiry is seen to be rigorous, fair, mm -hmm. done in a proper way so that that group of people do really represent the diversity of the whole of Bradfield in this particular case. One interesting thing, we're going to finish this little bit, one interesting thing in Gdansk in Poland where they've been doing some citizen assemblies around the concept of, I think it was flood mitigation, but related to these areas, there was a commitment by the mayor that if 80% of the jury members or the inquiry members back to particular recommendation, then that would be a mandate, mm -hmm. and they would automatically do it. So they were testing the boundaries of how you make policy and whether a, a small group of randomly selected citizens actually could mandate change within a democratic system, and that's quite a challenging decision to make. We're going to move on to the last little round of conversations, is how will you recruit inquiry participants and how many is the right number? So how are you going to find people to take part in your sessions of your inquiry? So any thoughts or perspectives from this group here? I would engage the, the group sortition that has done this, done it, I think, in Oxford and Leeds, I think. Um, is that, the, is that, I'm looking at you. So <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's a method. Of, of um, opening up the invitation across the de demographic of, of the area. And I know in Leeds, I think there were 400 people engaged with it, or they were invited. I think it was they were invited. And then of those that were engaged, the, the group randomly picked 20, I think it was, uh, but made sure then that they did reflect that demographic. I've not explained it very well. I understand that there is an organization that knows exactly how to do it, and, and that you can get the, the um, demographic. Are they expensive? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you're, you're in your role, really. I know, really. the <laughs> is more expensive. <laughs> but is it possible to do it thinking like to do it smaller clusters and then finding um, finding like the core gathering some perspectives from from these smaller ones and then discussing them together I mean, do you understand what I mean? like to yeah, groups of 20 times <coughs> what so we run multiple I don't know that that would work. Jury. Yeah, because the example was of gathering like hundreds, but how do you do that in a fruitful discussion? Like maybe you would need to be a smaller group discussing, but also not being only that small group. But so we have one demographic and uh, socioeconomic and positions group, and then we have another one with similar setup. How many, I think, I've got to, I think you've got to reflect in one group the yeah. whole uh, diversity of the, of the area, haven't we? Um, and it's been going to be important that we get people from the, uh, fr from the rural areas yeah. and mm. from the inner city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's not just a question of age groups or even socioeconomic mm. groups. It's mm. got to actually 
we do got to have the feel yeah. for, for their locality mm-hmm. and what would be appropriate. Because some of the steps that they might want to, to, t- to take uh, to achieve carbon reduction would be very different. You know, yeah. because if you get all the people saying, oh, well, we've all got to go vegan, and you don't get any, any, any farming people on the, you know, on the, on the, on the group, then, you know, the whole thing becomes mm. distorted, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, you might, still might get your 80% vote, but at least they've been there and they've had their say. Mm. Any other perspectives on how many people would be a trustworthy group of people to make policy around changing Bradfield forever? Um, I think it's important that there will be um, <coughs> it, it will be knowledge based when they take decisions so there's a, there's a, it's based on research and, and uh, facts not what everybody is thinking about is important from their perspective um, and I think that that's the thing with um, with Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future, they only say what the researchers say. They, they are messaging, they are taking up that message. And I think it's important this way as well, that um, not using this as a greenwash, for example. Uh, or for so, sh- so shall we say, because um, as a council, how many people are in a council? There's 700,000 <laughs> people in Bradfield. So in terms of the council, is it 12 people or 20 people? Should we have sort of the same number? Is that too small? Sounds low. It's a lot more than that. There's 84 councillors in Bradford, 23. 84? OK, so <coughs> because we can't afford to have too big a group yeah. or too small a group, so. We can't afford not to do this right. Something like 70. I was thinking it was 700,000. Yeah, okay. There's no, well, I'm going to finish this little bit, but you can <laughs> see some of the complexities of the design process. <laughs> Typically, a citizens' assembly is anywhere between 50 and 150, 200 people. Okay. And a citizens' jury is somewhere around 20 to 25. But what's actually more important often is the quality of the deliberation. And I've seen the recommendations from the larger assemblies be no better than the recommendations yeah, yeah. from the smaller ones. Exactly because of the way that people have been brought together to share and their perspectives, listen to, each other. Mm. listen to each other, but then also get expert testimony from different yeah. perspectives. And one of your roles, we can't go into it now, would be to decide what experts would go and inform yeah. the conversation yeah. before the recommendation. And so normally a citizen's jury is 30 hours of deliberation. We've got about 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> So it would be 30 hours over about 10 weeks where people, first of all, got to know each other, shared their prejudices, their presumptions about the climate emergency, then were able to test expert knowledge and then come up with a set of recommendations which are prioritised. But there's not one solution, but a whole set of things that might be done which are then presented to an open assembly involving people who can actually make change happen, industry, the public sector, academics, people who might invest in change. So there's a whole set of processes behind it. How are they selected? So how do we... How How do do you find the recruitment? So in the Leeds case, 4,000 letters were sent at random to people based on the geography in which they lived. So if you, they had so many percentage of people lived in the very rural areas, so so many letters were sent to them proportionally. So many letters sent to people in the inner city. So the first cut was to basically send an open invitation to 4,000 people. Then people were asked to respond, and yes, you're right, we got about three or 400 responses. And when they respond, they say, are you male, female? What's your age group? Are you from an ethnic minority? Do you ha- what's your income? So they provide basic information and then you match that against the statistics for Bradfield. And some people will live in the inner city and be you know, male and be from an ethnic minority, so they might have various characteristics. So we managed to find 25 people who matched the profile for the whole of Leeds. 
So that's quite amazing yeah. that we did use the Sortition Foundation. You're quite it right. is, yeah. So there's what's called a random stratified sample of people who are then also paid to participate so that doesn't exclude people who live in poverty or who might have other pressures. So there's incentives, so there's another cost there. We're going to go on to the last conversation. Five minutes, I think, we've got left for this. And the question is, what is the question for the inquiry to answer? So what question <laughs> should the inquiry answer? I'm going to write it up here. Five minutes. What the What's issue? the question? So what is the issue mm -hmm. here? It has to be written in non-technical language, How can we precise enough to produce recommendations, and open enough to allow for innovation, not predict, lead, or limit. So you're trying to think of a good question. Has Bradfield declared a, a climate emergency <laughs> and a target? They have declared it, but they haven't declared a target. Oh. Okay. So maybe we how, should how can we do a long-term climate transition as fast as possible in Bradford? Mm. <coughs> What's the big priority? Could you speak yeah, So we can all, I think everybody mm. needs to hear, okay. don't they? Say it again. Yeah. How, how can we do a long-term climate transformation as fast as possible um, in our, in Bradfield? How, so the que a how question. And transformation. I like how uh, optimistic that is. How can we transform, although it's not, how do we respond to an emergency because it's, it's terrible? I like the, I feel that that's, that's a positive starting point. Yeah. But I, I also think that there are some quick fix and maybe there are some long-term yeah. solutions. And mm -hmm. don't forget the long-term solutions. Um, maybe that, that could be more... Um, it's, a, it's not only about the emissions coming from here, it's also our consumption, for Absolutely. example, that, that mm -hmm. make climate change mm -hmm. uh, on mm -hmm. other places. And what do we mean by transformation? Do you think mm -hmm. people do not, will understand what we mean by that in our question? Well, one planet living. <laughs> <laughs> so we need yeah. to break it down so that people can, you know, the understand. The possible to have a one planet living. I like the word transform, mm. because other, other questions have been, how do we respond to the yeah. climate emergency, but transform infers that kind of radical change, doesn't it? Somebody else wants to propose a question. There's the first one, I think, how can we do a long-term transformation as soon as possible? I think that's what you said, is that right? Mm. Yeah. Anybody who wants to propose a different question? What about a question specifically linked to, let's say, our carbon budget? So mm -hmm. then we link it to a specific percentage. I don't know how we would phrase that. Do you think? Because we don't know what our budget is yet. Oh, we don't know. Okay. Uh, well, we yeah. might. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to reach the Paris goals or something yes. like that as well. Um, yes. And beyond. And beyond. Yeah. <laughs> to keep, to keep, um, yes. Uh, meet our share of the, of the global budget or something like that. Yeah. No, that, that sounds too, uh, that doesn't sound very um, <coughs> people friendly, does it? Um, so and do we need to add something how back? How could we meet our commitment to the Paris goals? Yeah, something like that. And can we have something about bearing in mind the need for equality or social justice yeah. or something in there. So how might everyone be involved? That's not quite what no. I meant. Oh. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, <coughs> I, I meant addressing inequality. Okay. So just, mm -hmm. just, just, um, just transition. Yeah. Just this is a bit of a job. But maybe, not maybe if we say that, how can we do a long-term just, yes. just transformation as soon as possible? Then you mm -hmm. include it in the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but Any other thoughts about what the question might be? There's one there. How just can the long-term food solution be uh, organized? So, 
So how can the long-term food provision? So that's to do so with a very specific that topic that you want question. to get involved in. How do people feel about that? I'm going to break the circle of such. Invite any questions from the audience. If we any other I think it'd be useful to get something in about the, the opportunities of transformation that could actually improve quality of life. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The, uh, the transition process mm. to actually transform people's lives. So how could we grasp the opportunity of the climate emergency to create a better city for everyone? Something, Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Something yeah. Yeah. So that might be a bit too hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good thought to turn this into a positive. Could also be visionary. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm wondering if we need a, a sort of measure, so both as a mm. citizen's jury and also at the end, we all know whether we've achieved it. You know, because if, if it is to get to zero or something, at least, you know, there's a, there's a metric we, we can kind of measure it. So but something it within the question that allows you to question. set some sort of goal yeah. that paints a picture of what success might be so yeah. that you might be able to... It might be a sub-thing. Yeah. It might be a general question and then something... I think we've got to have a carbon budget, actually, before we have the assessments, you know. Then we've got that extra information. Possibly so. I mean, there's a whole set of questions about how you don't predict the outcome by setting the framework. So we do quite a lot about alcohol, and, 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 the, and the NHS always comes to us and says, do an inquiry about how we stop people drinking. And we have to turn it around, because there's actually positives in alcohol as well. So we have to turn it around to say, what would it take to have a responsible relationship to alcohol? So the whole point of an open question is to try and open up people. So there's a couple here. Well, I watched those questions that have um, the word action in. Mm. Yeah. Is it, I'm trying to remember the word, but what was the end question was the greater Manchester, I think it's what the green and carbon neutral greater Manchester look, look like. Look like. Which is a bit vague. Mm. Action implies someone can do something. Mm. But, but although they will act and can act, otherwise you've got to be a vague answer. CO2 emissions right down as fast as possible while ensuring that everyone flourishes. I don't know exactly what it is, you know, but um, it, that, that just the awareness about certain buzzwords which seem to belong to one, uh, coming from one end of the political spectrum. I think that's quite right. It's really hard to get a good question. I think the one that's used in Leeds is how should Leeds respond to the emergency of climate change? That's the question. And then everything sits within that question based on the, the conversations that happen within that. So a very so, but it was set first to be too loaded to say to the climate emergency because yeah. that was too political. So it was the emergency of climate change. Just a couple of points there. Maybe saying responsible transformation instead of just would that be um, not so yeah, political? It's, it's, it's one of those words responsible, yeah, responsible. to whom by whom. Yeah. 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 Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> The it's point the there, same as I, yes. think, I think what we're saying is we've closed this session and we're just having a conversation. Yeah. Do you need to do anything? <laughs> well, let's carry on. <laughs> so, what do you. I'm interested in um, the actor that's in and the differences between some of these questions, which I guess depends on what the purpose of the citizens' jury or assembly is. Because the first question is that written up there is how can we? Uh, whereas the next is how might bread feel? Leeds, it was also how can Leeds. So who is it specifically what the council or, or the authorities should be achieve, doing to achieve it, or is it more we as in the community, everyone that's in the city? I'm going to throw it to you as a representative of, of Sheffield City Council that, that's declared a climate emergency. How would you frame this debate about, is it about what the council does or about what we do? Or I think when, we, when you start that debate, it's got to be open. Lobbying others to do uh, national government, for example. I think if 
approach that Camden has taken where they framed it around four or five different areas, including what can we do in the home, what can we do at work, what can we do on public transport, and looking at specific areas is quite helpful for framing that. Because I think some of those questions yeah. are very, you know, are, in one sense they're great because they're open-ended, but also that's probably, um, it, it it's, could be quite overwhelming. And to try and achieve it within the time that's available, I don't know how many hours of search it's, that, that need to be using, but to, to address the question around what can we do to address the climate emergency uh, without without some direction. I think that's where you need, you mentioned about the technical expertise and being able to present some of those options and also uh, some of the work that Manchester did around, for example, the scatter tool, giving you some indications of different things and understanding that if you do option A, there's a big um, impact on lifestyles, but actually that reduces carbon emissions very quickly. Do you want to do that? And it kind of almost turns it into more of a, a yes or no, but it gives people choices and they understand what the impact is, the time scale, what the implications will be on their lives. So I think you start maybe at that, that end of the spectrum, you work down to some of those more detailed those more detailed options. I'll come to you in a moment. I just wanted to say that what generally happens is the oversight group, this group here, sets the first, say, four or five, and I think in Leeds they said, we're going to talk about housing, transport, mm -hmm. and behaviour change, and yes. they set some frameworks, but after the first few sessions <coughs> of the deliberation, then the members of the inquiry say, we want to hear about this, <coughs> and so they start to direct their conversation, but that's the role of the group section. Point there. I was thinking there as well, it's interesting. I think in the end, the problem really seems to be now that we can then perspectives of people we haven't heard from. I'll come to you, but if you haven't spoken, I'd really like to hear your voice too. Do you want to say something in first? <laughs> uh, well, well, quick, I'll just respond in first to Mark, but often as you're setting some kind of, asking that kind of question in uh, organisation development, you say, well, what's the time scale? Here? What do we want to achieve in, five what do we want to have achieved in five years' time, I think. So, so that makes it more specific. Yeah. But also responding to what you were saying, I think this, to me it's a question about the the design of the process. And you, know, you were talking about kind of subgroups that might feed in, and this question of different options. So I, I have a kind of question in my mind about whether a single citizen's assembly is sort of enough. And I think in Ireland they had a series, I'm not sure about that. But you know, is there a kind of mapping out of the, the areas? Is there a process of refining those down? Is there a process of setting out the options with everyone knowing what the pros and cons are? Um, and we might refer to recent events in this country to think how that's been done badly. Could, yeah, so <laughs> that, that, you, know. you, you nearly said Brexit then. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just respond to that? So it's interesting in Camden where they've had their first mm -hmm. process. I have to say I'm slightly critical of Camden because yeah. I think they did their Citizens' Assembly in one and a half days. Did, a half you? day evening, maybe two half days. So very short periods for deliberation. But then more people. So you have this trade-off. Do you trust the fact there's lots of people involved or do you trust the fact that they've had a really deep deliberation and there's lots of mm. issues that politicians perhaps need to wrestle with people who are going to fund these processes? But, for example, Brexit. There are cases where people who are going to bring in constitutional changes hold the citizens' inquiry first and then those recommendations go to citizens for them to be informed about how they might think of an issue. So, for example, there was a citizens' assembly on Brexit, but it happened after the referendum, <laughs> done by <laughs> academics, so it never achieved yeah. anything. Yeah. But in Oregon, they have a history of holding citizens' assemblies before making a constitutional change. Now, I bet if everybody in this country hadn't received a letter from the central government with the government's crest on it saying, we think Brexit is a really bad idea, but instead of had the recommendations of a citizens' assembly on Brexit, we might have had a very different outcome. Because mm. a lot of those people were responding to that letter mm. as much as the issue of Brexit itself. I, mm. I'm only making mm. a supposition. So the question is, when do you have the assembly? How mm. often? Because in Camden, they have now said, the political leader has said, I want every citizen of Camden to be part of a citizens' assembly. Mm. Well, does mm. that make 
said. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it does, but no. then we're starting to ask questions about what is democracy yeah. and who speaks and, and, and why do we elect people at all mm. and all those mm. sorts of things. Mm. Yeah. Here's a question on what the end product of this is. Is the end product a series of recommendations for action or... Mm. I, I mean, I can see one, one perspective in this is that you, you come to a scenario where you say <coughs> we need to, uh, in different sectors, be doing X, Y, Z, uh, but then those sectors then have to go home and start dealing with those issues themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a whole process that bolts onto the back of step one, which then carries on in, in a series of, uh, of uh, sectoral working groups Right. which will hopefully then come back with something that's you've got firm commitments coming back or action plans or whatever it may be feeds <coughs> back into something that steps. Absolutely. It's a lot easier if it's just going to be to the council. Then you can say, right, these are the recommendations, it's up to the council to make their own decision. But if you're actually involving faith groups, you're involving business, you're involving, then you've got something completely different. Yeah. So that's again, at the end of the process, often there's some sort of public event where you start to action plan the recommendations, turn them into delivery groups. But there's a question. Once you've finished the inquiry process, like a jury that's doing a kind of a, a case, do you all get sent home? Or what do you do with the commitment and knowledge that's been built by those citizens who've come to that process? And so there are lots of design questions. And I think there are no answers to these things. Citizens' inquiries or assemblies won't solve climate change by themselves, they're just more hot air. But they are part of a process of, of moving people's thinking forward beyond the standard position is that person is, you know, represents the industry, that person's got a vested interest, that person comes with a thing they want to sell, whether it's the wind turbine or whatever, and therefore I won't say. So it's 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 the, it's a process of co-production at pace, but co-production's journey never ends. A mm. couple more points. Yeah. We were going to transition in a second into, um, I would want to bring in some of the experience in the room, while we've got all these fantastic people in Sheffield from around the world, to hear about, you know, like, does this relate to any of your experience? How, how would you take this back to your city? Those kind of questions. So any moment now kind of yeah thing. i think we're running and out then of maybe time maybe we could de-roll all the people in the middle we've got yeah, to two yeah. to <laughs> we've been de-rolled like de already yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're thinking for ourselves i know. Yeah.